Dr. Jane Lubchenco uh, is going to be talking now about science serving society, reflections on four years at the helm of a federal agency. So this sounds pretty interesting to me. I would love to get us all back in the room for those of you who are out there, but let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Jane. Hey everybody, sounds like my mic is on. That was a great panel. I really enjoyed listening to that. Uh, this is going to be something a little bit different. Uh, first of all, let me just say how pleased I am to be here with you today. Uh, I think each of you has such a key role to play, uh, not only in the immediate world that you live in, but for in, in bringing science and technology to society and being positive agents for change for society. Uh, that's not about uh, only about helping uh, other women. It's also about uh, creating a vision for a better world uh, and creating a world that we would like uh, our kids and our grandkids to uh, inherit. Um, I'm an environmental scientist and a marine biologist. Uh, I am fresh from four years in Washington, D.C. Uh, as part of the president's so-called science dream team. I grew up in Colorado. I was the oldest of six girls. Uh, our wise parents gave us lots of opportunities to learn about ourselves, to develop new skills, to figure out what we were passionate about, what we loved about, give back to society, and have a lot of fun. They also passionately believed that sports were important to all kids. And so even in a pre-Title IX world, uh, they sought out lots of opportunities for all six of us to play lots of different sports, both team sports as well as individual sports. In college, I discovered marine biology, and even though I had grown up in Colorado, I found this whole new world that I found so exciting and exotic, I just couldn't get enough of it, and I never looked back. After about 30 years of teaching and doing research, marine ecology, uh, along coastal areas around the world, uh, and after starting four not-for-profit startups that were focused on getting more good science into policy and into public understanding, the uh, transition team, uh, right after President Obama was elected in 2008, called and said, Jane, would you please come to Washington, D.C. and lead up this federal agency, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is in charge of not only weather forecasts and warnings through the National Weather Service, managing fisheries and being a good steward of our oceans and coasts, uh, providing a, a wealth of uh, science that underpins those services and stewardship, but also manning platforms such as satellites and ships and planes that enable NOAA to do weather forecasts and warnings, for example. So pretty broad portfolio. It deals with oceans and with climate, both of which I had had a lot of experience in. So it was a good fit for my, my skill set, my knowledge. Uh, but never in my wildest dreams had I imagined working for the federal government. I just loved the university world. I loved being able to be an entrepreneur. And so going to what for me was pretty much a foreign country, uh, even though I had spent a lot of time in and around D.C., was a major departure for me. Uh, I was asked essentially to turn my life upside down, uh, resign from pretty much everything, head to Washington, D.C., and lead this $5 billion agency, uh, 13,000 people all around the U.S. So for four years, I was at the helm of the nation's Ocean, Climate, and Weather Agency. Uh, as I mentioned, NOAA is a science agency, first and foremost. So there are people in the agency that create new knowledge by uh, doing research. And then that knowledge, whether it's from them or from others in the academic or business uh, world, that knowledge is then used to provide services like forecasting tornadoes, forecasting hurricanes, managing fisheries, uh, or to uh, provide uh, stewardship to help uh, us collectively understand 
what healthy oceans and coasts means and how we can achieve that. Uh, turns out my background uh, was in fact pretty good preparation for the rough and tumble world of DC politics. I knew, for example, how to swim with sharks. <laughs> now, many people have asked, uh, what was it like there? How does Washington really work, or does it? Uh, how is science and technology used in DC? Uh, what, in fact, is happening with our oceans, with our climate, with all this extreme weather we've been having, with Deepwater Horizon oil spill? So to answer some of these questions, um, I would like to take you on a field trip. I'm going to take you on a field trip to Washington, D.C., but you have to promise me that when I say D.C., you will hear D.C., not V.C., which is much more part of your world. Uh, I'm going to give you a glimpse into the world that I've inhabited for the last four years. Now, to get you in the right spirit of this field trip, you really need to think about D.C. as, I mentioned before, a foreign country. Uh, to thrive there, you need to learn the language, the dress, the values, the culture. That's not unlike going to any other foreign country. One of the most important ways of communicating in D.C. is through stories. Now, most of you have heard your own members of Congress uh, or the president talk about stories. They talk about people, things that happen to people, and they use those to illustrate a point that they're trying to make. Stories, uh, as social scientists, communication experts tell us, are sticky. They stay with you. People remember them well. It also makes the storyteller uh, more human, and people in Congress, uh, people in politics, uh, people in administration often are trying to connect with people and establish a rapport. So people like stories, and you will hear lots of stories told in Washington. So in the spirit of DC, I will tell you nine short stories. Uh, and as you will see, I think, the morals of many of these stories are actually relevant to the worlds that each of you live in. So story number one, working with Congress. And the moral here is that working with Congress successfully is both about understanding politics, but also understanding the importance of relationships. And that's true in the business world as well as it is uh, in the congressional world. So the story that I'm going to tell you has to do with my confirmation hearing. As I mentioned, the transition team called. This was actually mid-December of 2008. And uh, I was announced, along with other members of the president's science team, uh, one of those members was Dr. John Holdren, who was a good friend and colleague of mine. He was being nominated as the uh, president's science advisor. Uh, John and I were nominated together. We also had our confirmation hearings together. And we had very, very different experiences in the confirmation hearing. Uh, and that's the story that I'd like to tell to you. I had a really good coach in preparing for my confirmation hearing. John had a coach as well, but for whatever reason, that person didn't do anywhere near the job that my coach did. My coach said, you need to do three things. Number one, you need to have people that members of your congressional committee know and trust and respect send them letters to essentially say, she's a good person. You can work with her. I had worked a lot with members of both parties because I believe that science should not be partisan. Uh, and so I had worked a lot with both Republicans and Democrats over the years. And I had a number of them write letters to the committee, either former members of Congress or other people that they knew, and said, this is the context in which I knew Dr. Lubchenco. Uh, I think she'd be a great nominee for this position, and please give her your due consideration. John did not have that uh, advice and did not do that. Secondly, I was told by my coach, you need to go and meet every one of the members who are on the committee that's going to confirm you. Uh, establish a personal relationship with them. Uh, find some common ground. Don't just talk, talk, talk to them, 
but listen. Spend at least 60% of the conversation listening to them. Find out what they're interested in, what their aspirations are for this uh, committee, what they know and care about uh, with respect to NOAA. So I did these meet and greets with all the com committee members. John did not. Uh, and thirdly, uh, I, it was suggested that I have someone introduce me to, at the beginning of my confirmation hearing, someone who is a sitting member of Congress who knew me, uh, and just to say to the committee, I'm in favor of this person. So uh, Senator Ron Wyden, who was one of the senators from Oregon, uh, and I had worked with him a num over a number of years, introduced me when our confirmation hearing began. He began by saying, uh, colleagues, I want you to know that Dr. Lubchen Co. is the bionic woman of good science. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> this is going to be interesting. Uh, <clears throat> so my confirmation hearing went very smoothly. I had respectful, good uh, questions from both the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, two of the Republicans on the committee that could, could have given me um, a lot of grief uh, simply because I was being nominated by a Democrat and they were Republicans uh, and there's always this tension. One of them uh, when I went to meet with him, he, one of the first questions he asked was, do you scuba dive? And I said, yes. So we started talking about scuba diving. And we spent almost all the time talking about scuba diving and things that we'd seen, places we'd gone. Uh, and he invited me to go on some scuba trips with him. And, you know, it was very, uh, it was fun. Sort of toward the end of the conversation, he said, oh, yeah, by the way, I need to tell you that there are these issues that I'm concerned about. And I said, I'm happy to listen. I'm happy to talk. I think we need to have an open, free exchange of information. We may not agree on everything, but that's okay. We can at least understand where we're coming from. When it came time for him to question me at my confirmation hearing, he said, Mr. Chairman, I had a great meeting with Dr. Lubchenko. I know I can work with her. I have no questions. And that was it. And then he proceeded to just attack Dr. Holdren and really rake him over the coals about all sorts of different things. Uh, another member of that committee said, uh, I went and met with him. And I knew that we would not have a lot of common ground uh, in terms of issues. Uh, but nonetheless, it was really important to me. He came from a state where my grandmother was born and my daddy were born, was born. So we sort of established uh, that connection. And he, too, when it came time for him to ask questions, pretty much gave me a pass. Uh, and he really, really raked uh, John Holdern over the coals. So uh, that particular story, I think, really illustrates the importance of relationships and of taking time and being respectful, establishing some kind of common ground whether you completely agree with the other person or not. And then you can have a working relationship. And that was true throughout the four years that I was there, not only for my confirmation hearing. I tried to stay in touch with members of Congress of both parties over lots of key issues, whether we agreed or not. Uh, and that's really important. You need to go to people not just when you need them, but when you don't need them, and keep that relationship going. So that was really uh, important. The follow-on to, so John and I uh, were both, in the end, voted uh, by the committee to confirm us. Uh, and then the next step in the process is the committee votes, and then it goes to the full Senate. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, in this case, uh, a member of the Senate put a hold on both John and me, uh, Holds for a while can be uh, confidential. The member, the senator who puts a hold doesn't have to disclose who he is or why the hold is on you. You just have a hold and your appointment is stuck. You can't go forward. That hold, um, somehow a reporter discovered who the person was who had a hold on us. Uh, she reported it in the Washington Post and all hell broke loose. 
Uh, many people in the academic community that had been really cheering for John and me just bombarded this senator's offices with calls. How dare you hold up these important positions? Turned out he was a Democrat. He had no problem with John or me, had nothing to do with us. It was he was upset with what uh, Harry Reid was doing on Cuba, had nothing to do with us. We just happened to be the next appointments in line. And so it was all about politics. But when it was public that he had the hold and he just got call after call after call, especially from the universities that are in his state, uh, then in fact he released the hold, we sailed through, uh, and the very next week I got in my office an American flag that had been flown over the Capitol uh, with a note, a certificate saying, Senator X has had this flag flown over the Capitol for you in honor of your confirmation. And uh, so that was, uh, I guess, his way of apologizing. Uh, but it was uh, an interesting experience. Um, <clears throat> so I think that uh, that particular story really uh, illustrates, uh, again, the importance of relationships and the importance of cultivating them. So mid-March, uh, I was off and running as head of this agency, <clears throat> and uh, I quickly came up to speed on, on much of the diversity within the agency. It's a pretty incredible agency, and I was really, really proud to be affiliated with it. Some spectacular uh, civil servants, uh, people who toil day in and day out. Uh, you hear uh, from a distance from D.C. about federal workers and all these scandals, and right now Washington is just sort of totally focused on scandal politics. Uh, but I can tell you that from working in this federal agency, uh, the people that I knew at NOAA that were federal employees uh, are really, really dedicated, so focused on the mission, uh, and do so despite a lot of craziness that's in D.C. Um, one of the um, wishes that mariners make to one another when they set sail to sort of uh, give them good hopes for the journey uh, is the following, fair winds and following seas. That's the, uh, the, the wish, the hope. Uh, and I thought if I ever write my memoirs about the four years that I spent in D.C., the title would be uh, fair winds and following seas, question mark, anything but, because it really was an incredibly turbulent four years. Uh, we had a dysfunctional Congress, super partisan, legislation light, we had an economy in tailspin. We had serious politicization of climate science, uh, much of it targeted at NOAA. We had the Gulf oil spill disaster for which we had a lot of important responsibilities. We had a legacy satellite uh, program that had, was seriously dysfunctional and needed to be fixed. And we had the most extreme weather in any four years in U.S. history. We had over 770 major tornadoes. We had 70 Atlantic hurricanes, six major floods, three tsunamis, historic drought, prolonged heat waves, record snowfall and blizzards, all in four years. Just listening to that litany gives me the shivers, remembering uh, many of those. Um, each of those was a nightmare. Collectively, they could have easily swamped a very ambitious agenda that I took to D.C. I did not go there to be a caretaker. I had things I wanted to accomplish. And in fact, many of the folks at NOAA had a lot of ideas that I embraced, and we collectively defined where we were going. Uh, and uh, despite all that craziness, we were actually able to accomplish a lot. Uh, <clears throat> the amazing team at NOAA donned their toughest foul weather gear, and they embraced my agenda, I embraced theirs. Uh, and because we understood the importance of partnerships with other federal agencies, with the White House, with uh, key members of Congress, stakeholders, uh, we were able to actually accomplish uh, an awful lot on multiple fronts. Science played a key role in our doing so. Uh, but good science is not enough. It has to be communicated. Uh, and it's not just about the content. It's also about relationships and about diplomacy. And I think uh, that that's true in multiple worlds. 
Two quick stories about communicating science. Uh, one has to do with the satellite programs that I mentioned. We have satellites in space, weather satellites, that NOAA has built and flown and operates. Those satellites provide over 90% of the data that go into our numerical weather models. So they're really, really important to be able to forecast weather. Uh, as I mentioned, the satellite program was in trouble. We worked really hard and proposed and uh, fixed the, the pro problems. Uh, I was going around to members of Congress to describe to them what we had done and why these satellites were so important, why they needed to be funded adequately now that we had fixed the management problems. And I was talking one afternoon to a gentleman uh, from the House of Representatives, talking to him. He was a key on a key committee, a key member on a key com committee. And I talked to him about the weather satellites, and he said, Doctor, I don't need your weather satellites. I've got the Weather Channel. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, did I misjudge what he understood about what I was talking about? And I, you know, I had to do some very quick backpedaling, but I realized uh, good communication means understanding where the person is that you're communicating with. And if you misjudge that, then you're just talking past one another. And that is so important, especially for people in technology, in science, where we use a lot of jargon. We don't even know it's jargon. We use a lot of framing. We make a lot of assumptions. And in talking to non-scientists, it's really important to figure out where they are so that you can go from the known to the related unknown, give them new information, not by dumbing it down, but by having a real exchange of information. Second story uh, is about the Gulf oil spill. Uh, this was simultaneously a major environmental disaster as well as a very significant human tragedy. Uh, it was also a very uh, challenging communications situation. The irony of uh, the oil spill is that we were celebrating that week the 40th anniversary of Earth Day. Now, Earth Day was started in part as a response to the oil spill in Santa Barbara in 1969. So here we were 40 years later celebrating Earth Week and this oil spill happened. NOAA has uh, significant responsibilities in oil spills defined by legislation, the Oil Pollution Act that was passed in the aftermath of the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Uh, NOAA provides scientific advice to the Coast Guard. We forecast weather for the immediate area and uh, o um, ocean movement, ocean currents, so we know where the oil is and where it's going to go. Uh, NOAA's responsibility is to keep seafood safe by closing areas to fishing and then opening them up only when the oil is gone and the seafood is safe, uh, protecting marine mammals and turtles, uh, and then assessing the damage to the natural resources and uh, helping to recover the gulf uh, or the place that spilled in the aftermath of uh, the disaster. I was one of the six principals who was in charge of making day-to-day -day decisions, coordinating activities across the federal government. Uh, so together with the Secretary of uh, the Interior, Secretary of Homeland Security, um, the Administrator of EPA, uh, the Commandant of the Coast Guard, uh, who became the National Incident Commander, Thad Allen, uh, and a Senior Advisor to the President. Those six principals met uh, at least daily throughout the duration of the spill and made a lot of the day-to-day -day decisions. Uh, during that event, so that's context for you, during that event <clears throat> uh, the Vice President was asked by the President to go to the Gulf and to talk to fishermen about what we knew, what was happening. Uh, they had had, you know, one disaster after another in the form of hurricanes. <clears throat> a lot of them were just getting back on their feet and then here comes this oil spill and it was truly a disaster for many of them. Uh, I was asked to go with the Vice President to the Gulf because he didn't really know much about fisheries or about what we were doing on them. 
and I was asked to fly with him on Air Force Two. So on the plane, I was briefing him on the way down to the Gulf, and I was describing to him uh, what we knew about where the oil was, where it was going to go, how we were closing areas uh, to fishing, how we were telling the fishermen which areas were closed, how we were planning to open them back up after we had sampled the, the seafood repeatedly to make sure it was free of hydrocarbons. Uh, and partway through this description, he stopped me and he said, now wait a minute, I thought you were a scientist. And I said, I am. He said, but I understood everything you just told me. <laughs> now, you know, what does that tell us about the very poor job that scientists typically do? How many people has the vice president had brief him that were scientists? Lots and lots and lots. And yet his impression is that he can't understand scientists. So that's really on us to figure out how to communicate in non-technical language. And I believe, and some of the programs that I've started, train scientists to do a better job of doing what I call being bilingual. You need to be able to speak the language of science or technology or engineering. You need to speak the language of lay people. And you can learn to do that. But it takes practice, it takes networks, it takes uh, opportunities to learn. So uh, the story with the media in the Gulf was also challenging. Uh, many of the media uh, had sort of two storylines that were out there. Either the Gulf is dead, or it's just fine, thank you very much, everything will be healed shortly and it's no big deal. And any time that anyone was not sort of in one extreme camp or the other, uh, you'd get attacked from both sides, which was pretty much what would happen throughout. Uh, so, you know, I, I actually had a member of the media say to me, either the Gulf is dead or the spill is no big deal. Which is it? Um, and that's, that, that uh, framing is actually a very serious challenge. No, no nuance allowed. Next two stories uh, about weather, extreme weather and climate. Um, and the point here is the importance of using analogies and the importance of labels. Uh, I had a congressional hearing where uh, we were talking about climate change and what the evidence was for climate change, what NOAA's responsibilities were, uh, where we were headed. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, a number of members of the committee were asking the same question over and over and over. And the question was, Given that the last 10 years has not seen much change, uh, if any, in global average temperatures, doesn't that mean that climate change is not happening? And I would say 10 years is not a long enough period of time to detect a change in a system that is inherently noisy. You need a longer time record than 10 years to do that. And I would say that. And we have lots of data to show that. But I would keep getting the same questions over and over. I finally had yet another member of the committee ask pretty much the same question. I knew this gentleman was a surfer. And I said to him, Mr. So-and-so, have you ever stood on the beach and watched 10 waves coming ashore? Could you tell me, based on those 10 waves, if the tide is going out or if it's coming in. And he said, no, of course not. 10 waves is not enough. And then he just kind of trailed off. <laughs> and although I don't believe that he thinks significantly differently about climate change, because it wasn't really about the information. It was, there, 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 there was something else going on. But he at least got that analogy. That analogy made sense to him. And I think often when we're trying to describe something that is different or new to people, analogies and metaphors are incredibly powerful as ways of connecting the dots for them from something that's known to something that's not known or something that's feared. And so as a communication tool, not only stories, but analogies and metaphors, I think, are really, really important. Uh, next story is about labels, also about climate. Uh, one of the things that NOAA is charged by Congress with doing 
is providing information about climate, what we call climate services. So information about climate change, uh, decision support tools, data, uh, and NOAA is supposed to do that and does that, but there are more and more requests for climate services these days. And I had proposed to do an internal reorganization within NOAA to take people from three different management units that were doing this, pull them together in a single new management unit so they could work together more effectively, so not move people around uh, physically, but just different management structure. Budget neutral, wouldn't cost the taxpayers anything. So this is what I consider to be good government, doing what you're supposed to be doing more effectively, more efficiently. Uh, the problem was we proposed that that new unit be called the National Climate Service because we saw it as analogous to the National Weather Service. Uh, and we were you know, doing what NOAA was supposed to be doing, but, but giving it a label. Uh, <clears throat> in that sense, the um, name got in the way, the label got in the way in a very serious way. Climate, anything climate uh, on the hill uh, runs into this political buzzsaw. So we were not able to do that. Uh, and in fact, uh, that sort of was one of the things that we didn't get done. We still provide climate services. We just can't call it the National Climate Service and we can't do it. We couldn't do this budget neutral internal reorganization. On the other hand, the Western Governors Association uh, is was actively asking NOAA for information about climate so that they could plan. And they came to us and said, would you please sign an MOU with the Western Governors Association to give us climate services? And NOAA said, sure, of course, we'll be happy to do this. Uh, and we went about doing that. In the press conference to announce this MOU, uh, I was flanked by a governor of a Western state who is a rabid climate denier. He had gone so far as to introduce legislation into his legislature saying it doesn't exist. Uh, and yet he voted to have this MOU. And I asked him how he, uh, didn't he see a conflict here? And he said, I don't care what we call it. I need information to plan. And that's what he saw us giving him. So there's a very different dialogue about climate going on on the Hill versus in the states where information to plan is actually uh, needed in an immediate and direct sense. I am uh, running short on time here, uh, so I'm going to skip a couple stories and go right to my conclusions. Uh, NOAA played uh, a major role uh, in many uh, successes uh, that we saw in the last uh, four years uh, that I'm extremely proud of. Strengthening science at NOAA, we created a scientific integrity policy. Forecasting the extreme weather disasters and saving countless lives, I know. Uh, fixing a disastrous satellite program that's essential to saving lives and property. Helping to create the nation's first ever national ocean policy. Uh, ending overfishing and aligning fishing economics with conservation. Uh, we accomplished uh, a huge amount. As I mentioned, we were not able to create the climate service or grow extramural research, education, and ocean budgets as much as I'd hoped. Uh, but I'm really proud of our accomplishments. I'm spending time now that I have retired from federal service uh, thinking about theories of change, what worked, what didn't work, what the lessons uh, learned are. Uh, and here's some preliminary thoughts on that, understanding that this is a work in progress. Uh, the arenas in which we made uh, progress were those where we launched efforts very early on, had strong partners inside and outside government, were persistent but flexible, and had solid evidence that science, uh, so, had solid science that was clearly communicated and relevant. Uh, good science is important, but good diplomacy is even more important. Progress hinges on finding or creating the right incentives and the right partners. Madeleine Albright said, the art of diplomacy is getting other people to want what you want. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. 
Finding common ground is also key to navigating conflict, but so too is having really, really thick skin. And I think growing up with five sisters actually helped a lot uh, in giving me thick skin. So DC is a world into its own. Uh, operating there is actually very challenging. It's exhausting and frustrating and depressing in many ways, but you can actually get a lot done. Uh, and I think this might give you some glimpse into some of life in DC. Uh, <clears throat> I've told you stories about uh, working with Congress is about politics and relationships. Uh, fair winds and following seas, anything but. Uh, doctor, I don't need your weather satellites. I have the weather channel. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. I thought you were a scientist. Either the gulf is dead or the spill is no big deal. Which is it? I told you a story about 10 waves are not enough to see a pattern. And finally, I don't care if we call it climate or long-term weather. I need information to plan. Uh, so that gives you uh, a quick uh, summary of uh, con condensed four years uh, through a field trip to Washington, D.C. Uh, I hope that uh, many of you, if asked to serve in a, a public servant role, uh, will think very seriously about doing that. Uh, know that to succeed, it takes many of the same skills that it takes in your world, uh, which is asking for help. It is paying attention to what others want and figuring out how to put it together with what you want. It's about establishing relationships. Uh, and it's also about having fun and having a vision for a better world down the road. So thank you all for your attention. I appreciate it very much. Thank you.